you today um, some of the work we are doing at CSIRO around blockchain, um, also self-sovereign identities and verifiable credentialing. Uh, so I believe these kind of topics are very relevant to this audience. Um, and uh, I will start with a quick overview of what uh, Data61 is, uh, CSIRO, and the kind of research and innovation that we do uh, on blockchain. So um, CSIRO is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. Um, it's uh, Australia's largest scientific research agency. Um, and CSIRO Data61, uh, is the data and digital uh, business unit or kind of specialist, specialist arm of the agency focusing on uh, computer science and data-oriented research. Um, so we are home to 1,100 people, um, more than a third of which are uh, research students, uh, PhD and master. Um, and our core business is obviously research, and it is specifically research in digital science and innovation, um, and um, leading to new research as well as working across disciplines uh, and sectors to apply technologies and drive impact. So that's, that's the main goal. And the expertise that we have within uh, Data61 includes AI, robotics, cybersecurity, um, and uh, data analytics and modeling, etc. So uh, there are a large number of teams um, involved in all aspects of these kind of uh, uh, topics. Um, we also have uh, extensive interactions and collaborations with uh, universities and partners. Um, so over 38 university partners uh, and 31 government uh, partners, including government, all, all sorts of very, uh, government agencies, and um, 91 corporate partners uh, as well. So we get involved in industry projects as well. Uh, we also host uh, a few uh, facilities that are cutting edge facilities, including the uh, Mixed Reality Lab, the Robotics Innovation Center, and the AI for Cyber Enclave. Um, so you, you can actually learn more about these. There are a few videos online uh, on the website, uh, on Data61 website, that you can learn about these centers. Um, and regarding um, blockchain, uh, the, we have a dedicated team. I'm part of this dedicated team uh, at Data61 uh, that consists of uh, seven research scientists, three software engineers, uh, and uh, a number of PhD students and master uh, uh, students. And we have, uh, we have also close relationship with uh, uh, many universities, leading universities in Australia, um, with which we collaborate on our research. So for example, we work with Sydney University on the Red Belly blockchain, if you are familiar with that. Uh, also with Monash University on blockchain in the energy sector. Uh, Swinburne University uh, has also a blockchain center with uh, five research scientists and engineers, and we have a close relationship with them as well, and many more interactions with other uh, Australian universities. Uh, we do uh, projects with government um, and also different industries. Um, most of which uh, we cannot really mention uh, publicly, especially for industry uh, projects. Uh, but uh, for the blockchain topic, our priority domains include fintech, energy, and supply chain in agriculture, food, transportation, and logistics. Um, and I will show you an example later on, uh, especially in the agriculture uh, uh, domain. Uh, for fintech, we have done projects with pretty much um, all the big four banks and also lots of government agencies like the Australian Financial Security Authority, the uh, uh, ASIC, Australian Securities and Investments uh, Commission, and the Australian Taxation Office, um, so uh, around uh, the blockchain as well. 
So uh, the approach we have for our work on uh, blockchain R&D has four main components, and we try to balance our work across all these four. Um, the first component is the core research activity, which uh, has a focus on uh, design principles around blockchain systems, their trustworthiness, uh, the use of smart contracts, and also uh, a number of architectural considerations of blockchain platforms. I'll cover more details in the coming few slides. Uh, the second component um, basically fulfills our role in government and education. Um, you, may not, you may not know this, but uh, CSIRO started back in 1916, uh, so more than 100 years ago, and it was actually called the Advisory Council of Science and Industry. So that advisory role continues today, and we often contribute to government agencies in a variety of ways. Um, we also contribute to education um, by publishing, uh, obviously, research papers and also uh, textbooks and um, training uh, the blockchain workforce of tomorrow uh, through our PhD programs as well. Um, the third component um, is our involvement in, with the community of experts around the world. Um, our team is actively involved in a number of standardization efforts uh, and also uh, international technical committees, um, particularly around uh, uh, standards involving blockchain, obviously. And last but not least, uh, we conduct projects and um, innovation, uh, like create innovation, uh, innovative solutions to complex problems. Um, and we do that through the application of original concepts and unconventional approaches uh, to solving these kind of problems. Uh, this can take a form of uh, uh, patents uh, and tools that we publish or uh, release. Um, and uh, we deploy these tools in large projects with either government agencies as well as industry partners. All right, so uh, I'll go through these four components uh, one by one and try to give you a few examples um, of what we do. So for uh, our um, the uh, our our contribution in terms of uh, uh, assisting uh, or pro providing assistance to the government uh, agencies around blockchain. Uh, these are a few examples of what our team contributed in terms of uh, principles and guidance for the adoption of blockchain technology. Um, the, these are three reports that uh, are available on the Data61 website. So I'll encourage you to have a look. Um, the first report is on distributed ledgers, uh, and it explores the scenarios for uh, the Australian economy over the coming decades. Uh, it helps understand what uh, might plausibly happen across society and economy. So it's kind of a, an introduction to what can we do with the with distributed ledgers? And that's very helpful for uh, uh, government agencies, as well as the industry in general. Um, uh, the second report is on the risks and opportunities for systems using blockchain and smart contracts. Uh, so this is a bit more technical uh, from the title, you can guess that. Uh, and it focuses on the technical risks and opportunities. So um, it's, uh, it's very much useful for uh, uh, system architect uh, uh, kind of role uh, to read these kind of reports. Um, the last one is uh, another report titled Blockchain 2030, a look at the future of blockchain in Australia. And um, this report explores um, what is the industry profile, skills, trends, and future scenarios in Australia around blockchain adoption? So yeah, I'll encourage you to have a look. Uh, these are really good reads over the weekend. Or, um, yeah. So next, I'll uh, give you a quick overview of what we do in terms of a contribution to education. Um, so we do that by publishing textbooks, delivering courses, and supervising students. Uh, so one textbook worth mentioning is the uh, Architecture for Blockchain Applications. 
that provides a, a fantastic introdu introduction to blockchain, um, how to design blockchain systems, um, uh, the blockchain design patterns that I will talk about later on uh, to achieve cost, performance, defendability, security, etc. Um, and it also includes some uh, industry case studies. Um, we also have a course that is delivered uh, at UNSW that builds actually on the textbook itself. Um, so yeah, obviously if we have a textbook, it's good to use it for a, uh, delivering a, a course on blockchain. Um, so as I said earlier, uh, we are actively involved with the community of experts around the world on blockchain. So this includes uh, taking roles such as program committee chair or guest editors of uh, some of the uh, major international conferences and journals on blockchain. Uh, our team is also involved as chair in the Australian Technical Community Committee for Blockchain uh, Standards, and we have been leading the Australian delegation of the ISO TC307 uh, blockchain standards. Um, so we, we try to uh, always contribute to these kind of uh, uh, collaborative work on standardizing blockchain. So the research that we do at CSRO Data61 uh, on blockchain, they cover all, a variety of aspects of blockchain. So including performance, scalability, the energy consumption, obviously, uh, and uh, data privacy, data transparency, um, all, all the kind of topics that are very uh, uh, critical for the success of a blockchain adoption. Uh, so pretty much what we try to achieve is find new ways to actually uh, um, improve the way blockchain networks and blockchain system work. And I'll show you a few of the innovations that we have done to do that, to achieve that goal. Um, so these are a few things uh, that I wanted to share in this uh, in these slides um, that are uh, research output. Uh, the first one I want to talk about, uh, and it's uh, very well explained in the textbook that I showed earlier, uh, is uh, about blockchain patterns. Um, and uh, the goal is to systematically capture and organize knowledge on uh, how to design blockchain-based applications. Um, and these are in the form of a set of design patterns. Uh, so a design pattern is um, pretty much a, a reusable solution uh, to problems that are commonly occurring uh, within a given uh, context. Um, and uh, when you are designing a, a software, um, this approach of relying on these uh, uh, design patterns um, considers the blockchain as part of a bigger information system. Uh, where patterns could assist to uh, to uh, uh, build a robust design of a large blockchain-based system. Uh, so some of the patterns are uh, explicitly identified based on real-world uh, blockchain-based applications that leverage blockchain's unique properties. Other um, the, uh, design patterns are variants of existing design patterns applied in the context of blockchain-based applications and smart contracts. Uh, so these patterns can be helpful to software architects, uh, developers, system administration uh, administrators, and technical leads who need to design and develop and also monitor blockchain and distributed ledger-based projects. Um, so we also include uh, in this uh, uh, set of patterns, some of the deci uh, uh, decision models uh, that help developer and developers and architects uh, select the appropriate patterns for blockchain-based applications. Uh, so most of the presented patterns and decision models should be applicable in concrete use cases, uh, regardless of the blockchain framework uh, and smart contract language that you use. So uh, it's, it's in the pretty much blockchain platform independent. All right, so um, a few other examples of research output that I will uh, glimpse through very quickly. Um, so we also investigate approaches to simulate large and complex blockchain networks. Uh, so as you know, it is expensive to run experiments on the blockchain. 
it's difficult to reproduce some types of uh, attacks or exceptions that can happen within a, a highly concurrent system. So that's when simulations play a major role in the research that we conduct. So an example of this is um, a research on security analysis, so blockchain security analysis. And the main objective is to identify uh, all sorts of uh, uh, attacks, in particular, uh, uh, parasite attack, double spending attacks, uh, hybrid attacks. And this is only made possible using these kind of simulations. Um, these are, uh, uh, this is a kind of a list of publication um, uh, record that we have in the team. Uh, so you can refer to our website to kind of get through this uh, literature and enjoy reading it. <laughs> okay, so um, I go to the uh, uh, juicy stuff now. It's the uh, kind of innovations that we have come up with. Uh, and I took um, just uh, four examples. Actually, I will uh, dive deeper into three examples. Uh, I'll start with uh, FViewer. It's a real-time Ethereum monitor or visualization tool. Um, then I will talk about Lorikit. Uh, it's a model-driven engineering tool that basically uh, generates uh, solidity code, generates smart contracts based on a business process that you define uh, using a business process uh, modeling language uh, or modeling notation. And uh, then I will talk uh, about MacroKey. It's a self surveying identity mobile app for Android and iOS uh, that can, um, obviously it's a self surveying identity app uh, and also able to interact with Hyper Ledger Fabric uh, to interact with smart contracts basically. And then I certificate. Uh, I would not. Uh, I, I probably would never have enough time to dig into all four. But I certificate is a smart blockchain-based uh, certificate system. So it's very useful to create certificates for all sorts of purposes on the blockchain. Let's start with F Viewer. So um, what F Viewer is? Um, it's basically a visualization tool. Uh, that visualizes the recent history of the public Ethereum blockchain. It shows 24 of the most recent blocks on the blockchain. Maybe I will switch to a live view of uh, FViewer. This way you can see how it looks like. Uh, so this is, yeah, live in animation. Um, so it shows 24 of the most recent blocks of the blockchain. Uh, so represented as the boxes here. And the current transaction pool represented in the form of circles. This is the pool of transactions uh, that are currently in the pool. Um, and all the uh, observations are collected by a single full node, full blockchain node that we use as an observer. Um, so first, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the chain of blocks. Uh, the most recent block is on the top left, obviously. And the circles in the block, uh, in the blocks inside the blocks here, um, are included. Uh, basically, are the transactions included in those blocks? Uh, blocks that become uncles or forks are shown in red, which is not the case at the moment. Um, and uh, blocks in the main chain are green. So what we are looking at is uh, all the blocks in the main chain. Uh, regular links here between the, uh, the blocks are uh, green lines. Um, and if there is an, a, a fork, uh, if there are blocks uh, that are uncle uh, blocks, their links are red. Um, so in each block, we also display the block number in the first line, um, and also uh, the miner who created uh, that block. Um, the uh, fuel gauge here, it's very small, so it's difficult to see, but each block has a fuel gauge. And you can see that it can be uh, empty or full or halfway through. Um, that's basically, it shows how much gas was used by the transactions in that block relative to the block gas limit. Um, the transaction pool uh, that you have here, shows all the transactions currently waiting to be included into a block. Uh, and when a new block is created, typically a number of uh, transactions uh, from the pool are added to it. 
So you, uh, if you wait in uh, long enough, you'll see a new block showing up and a, a bunch of like that one. Yeah, a bunch of transactions going into the block. Um, so yeah, a few informa like additional information about this. Uh, the visualization is obviously not possible to, to uh, uh, accommodate uh, the entire existing pool of transactions. It's too big. So what, uh, what we see here is only the, top, the last uh, 500 transactions. Depending on your internet connection, when you load this at uh, fviewer.live, um, if you have a very poor internet connection, it will only show 50, but it can go up to 500. Uh, more than that will be kind of uh, insane visualization. Um, and basically, yeah, it's showing the most recent transactions. Uh, the ether value that you see here on the uh, bottom left um, is the sum of the ether values of all transactions in the pool, not just the ones shown. So we show only 500, but it's uh, a lot more than that. And then you have an extended view here that basically um, it groups the transactions in the pool based on the uh, offered gas price. So you have the different gas prices here. And they, they form like different groups um, um, related to the transaction fee. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much uh, how um, it looks like. And that's uh, a very useful tool for um, uh, teaching blockchain. Uh, as well as explaining to uh, non-technical people what blockchain is, uh, trying to visualize it. It's, it's always difficult uh, to explain what blockchain is to uh, anyone. And so it's, it's very useful to have these kind of visualization tools um, to, to help assist with that. Uh, the other tool that I wanted to talk about is Lorikit. Uh, so this is a, a model-driven engineering tool for blockchain-based business process execution and asset management. It's a mouthful, but uh, simply put, it's, it, it enables engineers and domain experts to focus on the business processes rather than writing um, solidity code and writing smart contracts. So typically when you talk about smart contract, uh, the number one person that is supposed to define that contract <laughs> is a business person. Um, so they are not familiar with uh, with uh, coding or, or, or smart contracts. So it's very difficult. So that's that's the main objective of this tool. And what it does, uh, given a, a business process, you can actually model the process using this notation. So it has a modeling tool built in. And um, the notation is called BPMN, Business Process Model and Notation. Uh, it's... Um, fairly uh, standard in uh, in business process uh, management in general. So most business people would be familiar with this kind of notation. So it's like a workflow where you define the different steps and the conditions on when things can be done and not done, etc. cetera. Um, so pretty much what Lorikit does is to automatically generate a smart contract to manage the business process on, on the blockchain. So um, what uh, the uh, what the user is able to achieve with this is to generate on the fly um, uh, the uh, the smart contract of the uh, of the model of the business process that they are building. It's very useful because you can actually tweak the business process and generate a new version of that smart contract. Um, so Lorikit um, supports uh, fungible and non fungible asset registries, uh, escrow for conditional payments and asset swap, uh, and um, Lorikit's Solidity and Golang smart contracts are formally verified, and they are well-tested and production-ready. So it's uh, regardless of how you design your business process, it will always produce those, uh, that uh, quality uh, smart contract. Uh, it also um, can help with the deployment of the smart contract. Um, and the monitoring of the smart contract. So it's all built in, uh, which can reduce time to market and security risks, especially for business, a business person using these kind of tools. Um, so 
uh, we actually use this tool a lot in many of the projects we get involved in uh, where a smart contract has to be designed. So rather than coding the smart contract manually, we actually rely on this uh, well-tested and verified approach. Um, so something went wrong with my slides. Let me go back to... Oh no, actually it's correct. I thought it went back to the beginning. All right, so the next tool I wanted to talk about is MacroKey. Um, so MacroKey is a self-sovereign identity app. Um, and the slogan of this is your data, your terms. Obviously it's a self-sovereign identity app. Uh, you are supposed to be in control of your data and the way you interact with the blockchain, et cetera. Um, and the, uh, the, the key idea of MacroKey started uh, a few years ago um, with key management uh, issues uh, around blockchain. You have certainly heard of cases where someone lost their private key and they lost, I don't know how many Bitcoins, et cetera. So key management in blockchain um, is very, very important to solve. Uh, so obviously we can always blame the end user and say, you have to take care of your keys, but are there any really easy to use and um, reliable tools that we can have to manage our keys? And if those tools exist, obviously there are plenty of tools that can help you manage the keys. How easy are they to use uh, in a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, scenario of interacting with the blockchain? But also we try to think of this solution, MacroKey, not only from a blockchain perspective, but also uh, from a normal web, you, web browsing perspective. You don't have to necessarily use your cryptographic identity just with blockchain applications could be also used with normal websites uh, where you can authenticate on the website. Uh, so that, that's the main goal. Um, so I'll go through uh, a few details about what, what it does and how it works. Um, so if I want to describe this app, uh, it's many things into one. So it's a self-sovereign identity app. So when you, uh, when you install it and create a profile, you basically create a key pair. It's your uh, public key, private key, um, safely stored, the private key is safely stored on the device, but then um, you can actually use that key to interact with the world. So uh, it's an enabler of trust uh, because when you interact with the world, you can actually prove your uh, ownership of that identity every time you interact with a website or with another person. Um, and it's also a simpler way to authenticate because you are not involving passwords. It's a kind of a passwordless authentication, but also it's a serverless authentication. So it's completely not relying on any uh, third party intermediary uh, or server based um, authentication. So when you authenticate using MacroKey, it's your device, your mobile phone that is interacting with whatever you are authenticating against. There is no um, MacroKey server, for example. Um, the other aspect of MacroKey is that um, it allows you to store data on your device. Um, so it's kind of a personal data vault uh, and fully encrypted, obviously. Um, and that's very important because as you interact with the world, you can collect uh, certificates or credentials from different sources and keep them into your data vault uh, on the device. Um, it's also because of that, it can be used to uh, prove your identity, prove your credentials uh, to other parties. And finally, and most importantly, uh, it allows you to interact with the blockchain. Um, you can basically sign blockchain transactions uh, uh, directly on your device. Uh, and that uh, we have full support of Hyperledger Fabric and the Ethereum network. Uh, so these are the two blockchains that we support. Um, obviously, it can it can be extended to support uh, a lot more, but um, that's that's the main focus for the different projects we've been conducting. Uh, so yeah, the way it works in terms of authentication, it's um, it's using um, a simple way. Uh, we built a web SDK uh, that basically 
uh, integrates into any website. So if you have a website and you want to uh, get the auth microkey users to authenticate against your website, uh, all what you need to do is a single line of code into your website, similar to basically any, um, let's say, uh, Google Analytics. When you want to integrate Google Analytics, you need to add one line of code, uh, JavaScript code into your website, and that basically loads the, uh, the SDK. Uh, so in our case, yeah, we have that SDK that allows any website to be um, kind of macro key ready. And uh, the authentication is done through that um, SDK um, and shows a QR code that you need to scan with the app. So it's fairly straightforward authentication. And that allows um, a two-way communication between the device and your browser. And this way you can interact, share, uh, collect data from the website or share data with the website. Um, obviously with the user consent always um, yeah, uh, uh, as a, as a centerpiece of this interaction. Uh, so the applications of this are, there are so many applications, but a few uh, examples uh, include, for example, logging in into your university website and collecting a provable claim uh, or a verifiable credential about your uh, qualifications. You could actually um, then go to uh, a, a job website where you can uh, share that credential with uh, with that website uh, to get uh, uh, better offers of employment, etc. So there, there are so many different scenarios. Uh, here are like just three different scenarios, like proof of qualification. The other one is proof of driver license status uh, that can be useful when you rent a car or rent a truck uh, online. Um, you can provide that proof beforehand. Uh, that can um, help uh, speed up any processes um, or even proof of insur insurance status. So if you are renting a car and then you can actually provide a proof uh, coming from your insurance company that you basically are a, sell a safe driver because you did not have, you, you were not involved in any accident in the past two years, let's say, uh, that verifiable credential can actually be provided by your insurance company beforehand. And you would have it on your phone that you can share anytime with uh, other parties, including a car rental company, for example. Um, so uh, we applied MacroKey uh, to uh, a number of projects um, where MacroKey has been used for that purpose to basically uh, interact with the blockchain um, and sign transactions. Uh, one uh, early example, this is, um, I think, three three years back. Uh, we used MacroKey uh, to, or what was MacroKey at the time, because it has evolved a lot since then, uh, to um, sign uh, transactions uh, submitted to the blockchain. And this was using the Ethereum network. Um, and this was a work funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And the objective was to improve the import and export product certificate sharing. So when you want to share a certificate about a particular product that you are exporting, uh, the idea is to share that on the blockchain. And obviously, signing the transaction uh, can be done by the individuals who are on the field actually uh, doing the uh, registering the products about to be shipped uh, overseas. Uh, so the use of a mobile device in that scenario uh, is uh, very important. And that's when uh, we're um, getting this uh, uh, cryptographic service in your hand uh, in the form of this app uh, is very useful. Um, another example uh, that another project that we conducted recently um, is in the uh, agricultural industry. And um, so it's an external project uh, with one of the world leading companies in the agricultural industry. And uh, the blockchain that we used for this project is Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, so um, the idea is to establish trust and reliability in uh, picking up some compliance events. Um, so I'll show you a quick demonstration of that in a moment. But uh, the idea is that you have multiple parties involved. 
So you have the, the farmer, uh, you have the uh, transporter, you transport the, uh, the produce um, to different facilities like processing facilities, et cetera. So the, there are so many, there is so many, so much information to be collected uh, from different parties. And having a blockchain solution is the best approach uh, because if in these kind of scenarios, if you have one centralized entity that is controlling everything, that can't work because there are different companies involved. It's, it's too distributed for a centralized solution. And blockchain being a distributed technology is the perfect um, fit. Um, now, obviously, in these kind of scenarios, you have mobility uh, that is extremely important. Um, everyone is somewhere on the field, uh, registering how, may, how much of the produce has been planted, how much has been harvested, uh, the time of harvest, etc. So traceability is extremely important for these kind of scenarios. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was a very interesting uh, project to work on. Um, I'll try to give you a quick overview of one portion of this. Um, it's like a, a small demo. Uh, it's using an older version of MacroKey, but uh, the principle is exactly the same. So imagine you have a grower uh, or a farm, and then you have a processing facility, You have, and then you have the customer. So typically, uh, at the grower, you would have planted uh, seeds of a particular plant and then harvest the, the, that, uh, uh, the produce um, a few months later. And then imagine that um, for each of these, um, let's say boxes or sacks of uh, whatever uh, plant is being uh, um, produced in that farm, uh, you would have a QR code attached to it. Now, it doesn't have to be QR code. It could be other things, uh, barcode or RFIDs or any, anything like that. Anything that can identify uh, something that you are shipping around. And the idea is that the grower would basically assign these different uh, packages, let's call them, um, to a particular transporter. So you'd have the grower using macro key and then simply scanning um, each of these packages using macro key. So I scan the first one. And then as you scan one, uh, we call it a module. So you have a, a particular package that you want to uh, uh, assign to a particular transporter. So here I'm scanning multiple of these uh, packages. And then once I bundle them all together, I can authenticate. And by authenticating, I get this form that is custom made for this particular purpose. Uh, and that basically allows me to, uh, for example, declare these as harvested or assign them to a processing facility or to a transporter uh, or et cetera. So there are many scenarios that I can, um, I can use. And then once I pick what I want, what is the event I want to submit to the blockchain, that gets submitted. And then I can see here, um, the uh, details of the transaction being submitted uh, to the blockchain. This happens directly from my device. So um, obviously in this scenario, you would have to be connected to the internet in order to do this. Uh, a more recent version of MacroKey actually introduced uh, some uh, caching mechanism uh, or kind of a queue that uh, once you submit a transaction to the blockchain, if there is no connectivity, especially on a field in the middle of nowhere, uh, you are not guaranteed to have 4G, then uh, that will remain pending in your phone until you get connectivity and then it's submitted to the to the blockchain. Now, this uh, for this project, it covered uh, a very complex uh, business process. Uh, uh, so it's not just that's that was one example of interaction. But then you can imagine uh, that if the farmer allocated the three packages to one transporter, and then for some reason, the transporter actually uh, delivered to the processing facility only two packages. Uh, either they uh, did a mistake when they picked up the packages or they dropped one on the way to the processing facility. Uh, so anything can happen. And that's actually a compliance event. So if you have a compliance that the transporter was supposed to deliver the three packages and that they only delivered two, that actually uh, will be another. So the transporter will be scanning these QR codes and doing the same thing, 
simply to report back to the blockchain that they have delivered two of these packages, that can trigger some compliance events. So one main component of uh, this project was also to build a kind of a dashboard that showcases um, how blockchain uh, can actually um, raise alarms when something went wrong with the process and how these alarms can be um, uh, basically um, resolved uh, once once the other package that was missing is added to uh, the is delivered to the processing facility. So yeah, this showcase is how interacting with the blockchain can happen at various uh, levels, not only from uh, uh, like a, directly from a website that is hosted somewhere, but also from mobile devices on the field. And or uh, and the project involved not only macro key for on-device blockchain interactions, but also integration of existing systems and information systems from different processing facilities, the grower, etc. All right, so I'll talk with about also another project that we recently completed. Um, this is the national blockchain pilot for critical mineral with Everledger. Um, so Everledger is an Australian uh, blockchain provider uh, or platform. Uh, it is using Hyperledger as well. And, um, and this was one of two Australian government funded blockchain pilot projects that uh, uh, where one of them, this is one of the two, uh, it was actually worth $3 million that Everledger uh, was selected for that. And we contributed to this uh, through our collaboration with Everledger. Um, and the objective of the entire project is to enable um, uh, the traceability of critical mineral products in the whole supply chain for ESG compliance. Uh, and our role in this was to contribute with work on self-sovereign identity management in this particular project using MacroKey and also uh, CSIRO mining process uh, provenance through simulations that we, uh, this CSI, another CSIRO team uh, was um, providing as well. So that's all for today. I hope uh, we have enough time for questions. Um, so if you would like to contact us, please visit this website, uh, research.csiro.au slash data61 slash blockchain. You'll find a bunch of information uh, a, a few details about what I talked about, um, the different tools that we have, uh, and also contact details about the key pers people that are involved in the different technologies that I talked about. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Adnan, for the very interesting presentation. Um, there is one question in the chat that I just asked. Um, it's been said, uh, CSRO used to be a publicly uh, funded, uh, and what is the position on open sourcing tools, uh, utilities, like the ones you just presented now? Good question, yeah. Uh, so some tools that we build, uh, they are open source. Uh, some others, uh, so in general at CSIRO, um, going open source has to be driven by uh, different different considerations. Um, so when something is mature enough, uh, it can be either going open source, or it could be um, used uh, uh, like as a, a separate entity to uh, really achieve impact. So it's driven by what is the best strategy to maximize impact. Uh, if something going open source uh, is the right choice, then we go open source, obviously. Um, if some other technologies going open source is not going to bring the uh, the impact that we are hoping for, but actually getting um, like getting it into uh, a, a higher maturity level for a pot potential spin-off or anything like that, that's always something we can pursue as well. Uh, so it's um, there are many considerations to take into uh, 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 to consider in this uh, uh, choice of whether going open source or not. But there are definitely many, many open source uh, tools uh, that uh, are available through CSIRO. Okay. Okay, great. Um, 
So I'm just trying to see, uh, looking into the question, um, how can we experience that? Uh, how can we experience the interface of uh, macro keys? Great. So macro key is not yet publicly available. Uh, so it's a mobile app. Uh, we have built uh, the Android version. Uh, so it's uh, completed. Uh, the iOS version is under development. Uh, it should be completed soon. Um, and yeah, if you, if you would like to kind of keep in touch and learn more about when, when we will release uh, some version of MacroKey to the public. Yeah, just shoot me an email and then uh, I'll keep you in, in the loop. Okay, and then I think, uh, so another question I have is, I uh, was wondering if we can get some sandbox kind of things for the tools you've just demonstrated or some trial or uh, kind of um, somehow, some ways that people can access the tools or is it like, yes. uh, Staying in touch with you would be the best way. So, yeah, it's there is no uh, kind of one place where you can play with all the tools. Um, so it, it, there is no setup like that. But definitely, uh, just reach out, and then uh, we can we can um, discuss what what is exactly the the use case scenario that you would like to use these tools for, and then we go <laughs> from there. Okay, great. So. Yeah. When you were talking about like storing um, logging information in the blockchain database and things like that, so I was just thinking, um, what what exactly is stored in the blockchain in terms of the information that you store um, initially, and then per login, uh, or if it, if there is a like a fake login, what would be stored in the blockchain, or is it like all these information related to each other and these kind of things, if you can just um so in relation it. is it in yep. relation to the use of macro key or yep. another tool yep. yeah so macro key itself when you create a profile um the you, you can create <coughs> a profile completely offline so it's not actually your identity is not on the blockchain there is no blockchain being used uh so it's it's basically a simple key value uh, not key value uh, uh, private key, public key that you generate on your own. So that's why it's self-sovereign. And um, because of that, you are the only person in charge of that private key. And it is in your own device. It's not being stored on the blockchain or somewhere else on the cloud, etc. cetera. Uh, now, when you authenticate against a website, um, obviously that website has to have the our web SDK. But then the authentication is a simple, um, uh, basically handshake that you are establishing between your device and your browser to authenticate. And the authentication itself is a cryptographic challenge that the website is asking you to sign. So if you have the private key, then you will be able to sign it and the website can verify that signature. So it's pretty much a, a, a classical challenge signature. Um, but the key element here is that you, you are not relying on a third party. So if you think of authentication in general, uh, when you talk about OAuth and uh, all these kind of single sign-on solutions that you see out there, everybody is using this. Um, so from, from uh, uh, Microsoft Office or, uh, or Google systems, it, you always authenticate through a particular identity provider. So when you sign in uh, using Google, for example, you are actually interacting with the Google service to sign in. Uh, so there is always an, a, 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 um, a third party involved in your authentication. Now, if that third party is down for whatever reason, an outage or any other reason, uh, like being hacked, uh, then you, can, you are not able to log in anywhere. So, um, an outage of, of the Microsoft authentication services will actually um, make thousands of businesses stop working because they cannot log into their systems. Um, with MacroKey, it's completely distributed. So every user is authenticating using their own device. And that interaction is not involving any third party service. So there is uh, less risk for the users 
more data privacy and security because the interaction is completely local to your network. So if the Wi-Fi is still working, but the internet is down, any local local web-based system that you are using can still authenticate and continue working with microkey. Um, so that, that's a key thing about self-sovereign um, identities. It has to be truly self-sovereign, not relying on a, on a kind of cloud-based system. Even if these cloud systems, they always claim that they are fully encrypted, that they are having the best state-of-the-art uh, um, uh, security systems, uh, but still, if you are relying on them, uh, if there is an outage, you are you are basically not able to use your identity. So, um, and because of that, it's no longer self-sovereign. Uh, so, in terms, yeah, in terms of the your question was about storing data on the blockchain. Um, yeah, so in essence, when you create a, a, a macro key identity, you are not storing anything on any blockchain. Uh, now, if you go and log into uh, uh, a blockchain-based application, and uh, it happens that that application is using a Hyperledger fabric network, then uh, when you authenticate against that website, the website can actually store all the configuration details needed for your device to actually sign transactions on that particular uh, Hyperledger fabric. So all the network information, et cetera, are passed on to the app. So pretty much when you authenticate with the website, you establish this two-way communication between the website and your device. Uh, and then the website can store information into your device, into your macro key profile, and you can also provide information to the website. Let's say the website asks for your first name, your address, your date of birth, et cetera, at, at authentication. Uh, you have to approve that. So there's some consent, user consent in, in the sharing of information. That's, that's a key element as well. Yep. Uh, and then it's up, to, it's up to you. Every time you need to sign a transaction to save something to the blockchain, the app shows you a notification and asks you for approval. So Nothing is saved without your explicit consent. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, great. And the other question that we have is what happens if you lose your mobile then? Great is question. There... I get I get this question a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, um, what happens if you lose your uh, private key to interact with any blockchain? Obviously, if you lose your private key, uh, the scenario is you go to your backup. Uh, you need the backup um, to recover. Obviously, uh, any kind of uh, crypto wallet, uh, when you install a crypto wallet and create a, an identity or, or kind of a, a key on that crypto wallet, it will ask you to write down a passphrase on a piece of paper and save it safely somewhere. That process, we follow exactly that process as if uh, MacroKey is a normal crypto wallet um, it is actually a crypto wallet. It can play that role, uh, but we are using it for not necessarily to make uh, uh, cryptocurrency transactions. That's not, not, not necessarily the purpose. It could, could be used for that, but uh, it's more about smart contracts and interaction with smart contracts uh, and interaction with websites in general uh, to achieve um, uh, um, Many, many scenarios that are not possible through normal crypto wallets. Um, so yeah, if you lose your mobile device or you or basically yeah uh, gets destroyed or whatever, um, you can actually install MacroKey on another device and then import your uh, backup. Uh, obviously, when you import the backup, you need to type in the passphrase, the full uh, mnemonic passphrase that is typical of any crypto wallet. Yeah. Okay. Um, and obviously, if you don't have any backup, you just create a new identity yeah. and then recreate your, your credentials that you collected from other websites. So you have to go and collect them one by one. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there is a, another backup for that <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's um, seven. I think we don't have any more question in the chat in here. Um, and thanks, uh, Anthony, for joining us. It was a very great uh, presentation.
uh, very welcome. interesting tools um, and we look forward to um, to see these tools and, and play with them uh, once they get um, available for public as well. Yes. Uh, and thanks and for, for accepting our invite to join You're us. welcome. And anyone interested, uh, yeah, send me an email or visit that website that is on the screen uh, to get the contact details of the rest of the team. So um, yeah, happy to help and provide uh, access. OK, thanks. And thanks, everyone else, for joining us today. Um, if you haven't followed our Discord channel for Hyperledger Surlasia ch chapter, please follow so and uh, our Meetup uh, channel so that we you will be notified for our next events. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Anthony. You. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.